This is a nostalgic review of the most powerful gaming graphics card of 2015, the GTX 980 Ti. This is also the second episode of the second trilogy of the nostalgic GPU series and today we will be looking at the pinnacle of Huang's best consumer grade card of 2015, the GTX 980 Ti, which directly competed with the R9 Fury X, which I reviewed quite recently. If you're here for the first time, give the video a like and subscribe with the bell icon on so you don't miss future videos. As usual, we will start off with some history of the Maxwell architecture which birthed the entire GTX 900 series. So what features did the then new architecture bring to the table? Maxwell did bring about many new innovations compared to the previous Kepler architecture. However, it was a newer generation and it brought with it a significant increase in performance and efficiency as well as the improved optimization of CUDA cores. In terms of software, the Maxwell architecture did introduce some new features, the first of which was Dynamic Super Resolution or DSR for short. DSR is a technology that allows you to run games at a higher resolution than your monitor supports. For example, if you're playing on a 1080p monitor, this feature allows your GPU to render games at a higher resolution like 4K and this is meant to increase the clarity of the image although it was quite demanding in terms of performance given your GPU was internally rendering a higher resolution than your monitor. The next feature is multi-frame sampled anti-aliasing or MFAA for short. This was an improved version of MSAA, providing up to a 30% increase in performance over MSAA at no cost to the quality. Another feature was VR Direct, which was a function aimed at reducing rendering latency and improving performance in VR headsets. NVIDIA also improved G-Sync, a technology used for synchronizing your monitor's refresh rate with the FPS from your GPU, resulting in smoother gameplay with low latency and no artifacts. Another improvement the GTX 900 series had over their predecessors was full support for DirectX 12.1 which has allowed them to remain relevant to this day and run most games without any problems. And finally, the last crucial feature was the Voxel Global Illumination Algorithm or VXGI for short. This was the algorithm that paved the way to Nvidia's RTX era. VXGI was designed to simulate lighting effects in real time by calculating how light interacts with surfaces in a scene, including indirect lighting, reflections, and shadows. The algorithm uses a voxel grid to represent the scene's geometry and lighting, allowing for efficient calculations of how light bounces off surfaces and contributes to the overall illumination. VXGI demonstrated the potential for real-time global illumination in games, leading to the development of a new standard for visual fidelity we have come to know as ray tracing. Now moving on to the GTX 980 Ti specifications. The 980 Ti is based on the 28nm GM200 chip, making it a slightly cut down GTX Titan X with about 9% less CUDA cores, half the VRAM at 6GB of GDDR5 instead of 12GB, both the frequency and the memory bus remained the same, meaning the TDP is also identical, and when it came to the price, Nvidia set the price tag for their cut-down Titan X, the 980 Ti, at 649 while the Titan X itself was set to 999 This was a reduction in price from the previous gen flagship GTX 780 Ti that cost $699 at launch. Naturally, the regular GTX 980 got a reduction in price from $549 to $499. Lucky for you, we have left some links in the description for our viewers to get something new for even less depending on your budget, so check the links out. Now for the benchmarks and as usual, the test will be done in 1080p. I will compare the 980 Ti's tests to the 780 Ti to see how much of a generational leap in performance it was and how much better it has aged being the more recent of the two. Starting off with the superposition benchmark, the GTX 980 Ti has a massive 54.4% lead on its predecessor, the 780 Ti. Moving on to games, I started with Crisis 3 on Ultra with 4 times MSAA. The game runs great on the 980 Ti, with averages of 50 and up to 60 plus FPS, and if we compare it to the previous flagship, the GTX 780 Ti, the 980 Ti is faster on average by about 20% in this game. 
In Far Cry 4 on Ultra using SMAA, as you would expect, we get a playable experience with the 980 Ti in this game, with averages hovering around 100 plus FPS, with a smooth frame time graph, even with the 0.1% lows remaining above 60 FPS, and when compared to the 780 Ti, the 980 Ti gets an impressive 58% lead in this game. The next game is Battlefield 4 on Ultra with 4x MSAA. The 980 Ti gives us decent performance of around 100 to 130 plus FPS with a smooth frame time graph, and when we compare it to the GTX 780 Ti, the gap is even bigger than the previous one as the 980 Ti gets a 63% increase in performance over its predecessor. In The Witcher 3 on high, the 980 Ti has no trouble at all running this game and keeping it above 60 FPS even in Novigrad with averages ranging from 70 to 80 plus FPS, so it's safe to call it playable. Next is GTA 5 on Ultra with 8x MSAA. This game was actually released for PC the same year the 980 Ti was launched, so you can expect the game to run very well on the 2015 flagship, and as for performance, we get averages ranging from 75 to 80 plus FPS. Next is Quantum Break on Ultra. The finished masterpiece runs great on the 980 Ti with a smooth frame time graph and we get 70 to 80 plus FPS. When compared to the 780 Ti, the 980 Ti takes the lead with a massive 88% increase in performance, which is yet another massive performance gap. Next is Watch Dogs 2 on very high with SMAA. Things are just as you've come to expect by now, with the 980 Ti getting 70 to 80 plus FPS, which is a huge improvement compared to the 780 Ti that maxed out at 38 FPS average. This means the 980 Ti has a massive 97% lead over its predecessor, which is basically double the FPS. In Battlefield 1 on Ultra, using TAA, we get a good example of good DX11 optimization, giving us 110 to 120 plus FPS with a smooth frame time graph but when running the game in DX12 mode, we lose 10 to 15 FPS and it's a starter fest with 0.1% lows being worse on DX12 mode. In Battlefield 5 on Ultra, using Tier A, the 980 Ti manages to give us a decent 80 plus FPS on the more demanding title with minor drops to 70s, meaning when compared to the 780 Ti, the same 97% lead we saw earlier is seen in this game too as the 780 Ti averaged 42 FPS on the same settings. DX12 works better in this title, giving us the same performance as DX11 but with better 0.1 and 1% lows. Next is Shadow of the Tomb Raider on high. The 980 Ti manages to remain above 70 plus FPS and sometimes goes up to 90 to 100 plus FPS in some scenes. This adds up to another impressive lead of 71.4% over the 780 Ti that averages 50 FPS in this game. Using DX12 in this game gives us better performance and we get 89 FPS on DX12 and 84 FPS on DX11 with significantly better 0.1 and 1% lows on DX12. The next game is Control on medium settings. Using the GTX 980 Ti, we get a playable 70 to 80 plus FPS on what is a rather demanding game even on medium settings, and when compared to the 780 Ti, the 980 Ti gets another massive 90.6% lead in FPS which is nearly double the FPS of its predecessor. Next is PUBG, also on medium settings. The 980 Ti gives us a decent and very playable battle royale experience with averages ranging from 120 to 130 plus FPS with a smooth frame time graph. Fortnite was next, playing on medium with GSR on quality. Even if it's on medium settings, this is an updated and new gen Fortnite with new lighting techniques, but the 980 Ti still manages to remain above 100 plus FPS most of the time with no lags or drops in FPS. Next is Far Cry 5 on Ultra with TAA. The 2015 flagship easily gets 80 to 90 plus FPS in this game, while the 780 Ti maxes out 49 FPS average, 
so it's another massive generational victory of nearly double the FPS when comparing the 980 Ti to the 780 Ti. Next is Red Dead Redemption 2 on high. In the in-game benchmark, the FPS averages hover around 50 to 55 FPS, which is still a very decent and playable experience given how demanding the game is even in today's standards. Next is Apex Legends on low. Using the competitive settings, we get to remain above 200 plus FPS, meaning you can still get a high refresh rate experience with the 980 Ti in this game. Next is Days Gone playing on high settings. Despite how recent the games keep getting, the 980 Ti still gives us a flagship tier performance and in this game we get 80 plus FPS which equates to a 64.7% increase over the 780 Ti. Next is Doom Eternal playing on high settings. We get 100 to 120 plus FPS in the Vulcan API showing that GeForce and Vulcan can work well together giving us a more than playable experience. The settings could have been set higher but some have a 4GB limit which we will talk about in more detail in the third part of the series. Next is Cyberpunk 2077 set to a mixture of medium and high settings with FSR 3 set to quality. In this game, we get about 65 to 70 FPS with a smooth frame time graph, meaning it's definitely enjoyable with this card. And then next is Mafia Remake on high settings. We get a stable 80 plus FPS, which is a huge improvement compared to the 46 FPS on the 780 Ti. Next is Dying Light 2 on high with FSR set to ultra quality. Despite this being a more recent game, the 980 Ti still manages to keep us above 60 plus FPS and even manages to go past 70 plus every now and then, which is impressive and very playable. The finals was next, playing on low settings, and this is another multiplayer game you can play with the 980 Ti while using competitive settings it manages a decent 70 to 80 plus FPS, which is definitely playable. Hogwarts Legacy on medium is next, with FSR 2 set to quality. We get averages of 60 to 70 plus FPS running around in Hogsmeade, and we have FSR to thank for that, keeping the older card relevant for a game like this. Next is Spider Man Miles Morales on medium, with FSR 2 set to quality. Even in a busy area on the map, we get 70 to 80 plus FPS, meaning it's more than playable and you have enough headroom to use more demanding settings if you want to. Next is Remnant 2 on low with FSR 3 set to balanced. This is a recent game that is brutal on all the cards, but the 980 Ti manages a decent 60 plus FPS average, so safe to say it's definitely playable. Next is The Last of Us on medium settings with FSR set to quality. We get 40 to 45 FPS with the 980 Ti as optimization is in short supply these days and the game is known to be very demanding but it's still enough to be considered playable on a single player title like this. NFS Heat is next on medium settings with FSR 2 set to quality. FSR is a gift to older cards like this as we managed to get 70 to 80 plus FPS, which is more than enough for a racing title like this and overall it feels very responsive. Uncharted 4 is next on high settings, with FSR 2 set to quality. This is another decent showing due to FSR, where we get 60 plus FPS most of the time, making it possible to enjoy this game with the 980 Ti. Next is Counter-Strike 2 on low settings with 2 times MSAA. On average, we get around 200 to 220 plus FPS with minor drops in smokes and fires, but aside from that, it's very playable on the 980 Ti. Next is Atomic Heart playing on medium settings. We get 70 to 75 plus FPS with a smooth frame time graph, so it's very playable, and when compared to the 780 Ti, there is a 37% lead, which is about 20 plus FPS in this game. Next is Alan Wake 2, and when the game first launched, it was basically unplayable on anything lower than an RTX 20 series card, but they later patched the game for all the cards, increasing performance significantly. As for the 980 Ti, we had to run everything on low and utilize upscaling, 
which in this case is FSR set to quality. And thanks to FSR, we managed to get a decent 40 to 50 plus FPS. The catch, however, was the flickering artifacts occurring when looking at some light sources, which makes the game near unplayable. Next is Horizon Forbidden West, set to medium settings, with FSR set to quality. Using medium settings and help from FSR allows us to run the game at an acceptable 55 to 60 FPS. Next is Warhammer 40k, playing on low settings, with FSR set to quality. We get averages hovering around 35 to 40 FPS, which is quite low but not entirely unplayable. God of War Ragnarok was next, playing on medium with FSR set to quality. The FPS remains at a decent 50 to 60 FPS, which is impressive for a recent title like this on a 9-year-old flagship. Next is Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Playing on low settings, with some help from FSR set to quality, we get a decent 60 to 70 plus FPS. Safe to say, it's very playable on this card too. Looking at the results, it's been clear to see how well the GTX 980 Ti performed in its prime, as it was always able to deliver 60 plus FPS playing on high or ultra. As the years went by, the card could only do 60 plus on medium settings, and as we have seen, anything released within the past 4 to 5 years has opted anyone with a 980 Ti to rely on upscaling to get better performance as games continuously become more demanding and optimization slowly ceases to exist. Nevertheless, the GTX 980 Ti still runs most games at playable FPS on 1080p with some help from FSR, and we will soon test it against its direct competitor, the R9 Fury X, to see which 2015 flagship aged better. Thank you for your time, don't forget to leave a like and sub, leave us a comment and tell us what card you had in the past, and if you're looking to upgrade, follow the links in the description to get the best deals on GPUs right now, and see you in the next one.